Okay, good morning and welcome to this week's edition of Encompass Live. I am your host, Krista Porter, here at the Nebraska Library Commission. Encompass Live is the Commission's weekly webinar series when we cover a variety of topics that may be of interest to libraries. We broadcast, broadcast the show live every Wednesday morning at 10 a.m. Central Time. If you're unable to join us on Wednesdays, though, that's fine. We do record the show as we are doing today and it will be available for you to watch later at your convenience. And I'll show you at the end of today's show where you can access all of our show archives. Um, both the live show and the recordings are free and open to anyone to watch. So please spread the word, um, share with your friends, family, neighbors, colleagues, uh, anyone you think might be interested in any of the topics we have on Encompass Live. Um, for those of you not from Nebraska, the Nebraska Library Commission is the state agency for libraries. Um, so similar to your um, state's state library. So we provide training and um, resources and databases and uh, professional development and grants and all sorts of things to all sorts of libraries in the state. So you will find shows on Encompass Live for all types of libraries, public, academic, K-12, corrections, museums, archives. Uh, really our only criteria is that it's something to do with libraries. Um, something cool libraries are doing, something cool we think they could be doing. Um, we have a Nebraska Library Commission staff that do presentations sometimes um, about resources and things we do here, but we also bring in guest speakers from um, all across the country, uh, and I'd say all across the world. We've had people from outside of, Nebraska, outside of the U.S., <laughs> and that's what we have with us today. Returning, joining us is Brian Pitchman. Good morning, Brian. Um, and he is from the Evolve Project, and he has been on Encompass Live quite a few times before. Um, over the years, uh, talking about uh, generally sometimes things that are techie related, but sometimes things that are just very innovative. Um, the Evolve Project uses a lot of really creative um, programs and, and ideas and things. And he's going to talk to us about um, this memory initiative project, memory care initiative um, yep. that he's been um, developing, working on. So I'm going to hand it over to you, Brian, to tell us all about it. Awesome. Thank you. Uh, so hi everyone, my name is Brian. Uh, so yeah, I've been working with a group called MindCare and the objective that we're trying to help solve or the problem we're trying to solve is that uh, older seniors that have like memory care challenges, whether that's dementia, Alzheimer's, et cetera, don't have a lot of resources available to them. Like, yes, there's the Alzheimer's Association, but uh, it's a very complicated website. Uh, one of the things that I've been seeing as I've been learning more and more about this is that the resources and funding available for these groups, whether it's the um, person that has dementia or the loved one that has dementia or their caregivers, which usually is their like their children or their brothers or sisters, um, and that onus is falling on them to help solve all these things. And it's really, really challenging to do so. Um, and so my hope is that by having these discussions, uh, we get people talking about what can we do in our library space to support those with memory challenges mm -hmm. uh, and providing more inclusive spaces. We do tons of programming for kids. We don't do that many for, for like seniors. And so I, I, I fall mm -hmm. uh, prey to that as well. I, I built the Evolve project with a heavy you know, kid and teen focus. Uh, mm -hmm. And I didn't think of think things through for what else can we do for, for seniors even. Um, and, and that's so, a group that is getting bigger and larger and larger in our in our in the world too. Um, yep. Yep. And so I hopefully we'll we'll leave with some ideas. I'm gonna I always when I when I do this presentation I always like to reflect back of like how has technology cha changed as well and what can we do as part of our library programming experiences. As it relates to communication, one of the um, challenges that has has occurred is we go from like voice command, like we can voice command almost anything to our phone. Uh, I asked this question, but apparently everyone's really good at remembering phone numbers. I don't know anyone's phone numbers, barely remember my own. Um, but most of us way back when, uh, how to remember phone numbers. We didn't have like a phone we can save them into. Like you knew your best friend's phone number or, or his parents' house rather growing mm -hmm. up. And that was how we did things. Now everything is saved in a phone. Uh, 
the other thing that we've been seeing more is like an increase of texting and a decrease in calling people. Uh, and this idea of like delayed communication is more of a norm. Uh, and then we have social media also playing a huge role into our, our worlds. So communication as a whole has shifted. And so when we think through these things, uh, what types of devices should we have in our library spaces that help people that when you have dementia or um, memory care challenges, one of the one of the problems are you forget like this new tech and you revert to old tech. And so what can we do in our library? So I think we can do a lot of really great education on um, security and privacy. So how can we teach people about social media in the sense of what should you post, what shouldn't you post? Mm -hmm. uh, like as an example, you shouldn't post that you're going on a two week vacation out of the country and no one's be at your house. Like you don't do that. Um, or posting you know, your locations of what you're doing might not be always the best choice. Um, and also finding friends and then those people that probably aren't your friends and being able to decipher the difference between those two, I mm -hmm. think is going to be a very important programming. Um, and so my care, so I'm going to like sprinkle some products that I mm -hmm. think are important to like leverage. And so this is called a uh, memory phone phone. And all you do is you print out pictures of things and they're all speed dial buttons. So imagine having one of these in your library and a picture of the post office, a picture of the banks, like the local bank that everyone uses, whatever it may be, and placing them on the phones instead of having to remember a number. Um, and now you have like this really easy tool for people with, instead of having to go, up and, hey, I, I need to call the post office. I just don't know what their number is. You can direct them to something like this. Man, I could really use that for things like people have to call all the time, like the vet or, or something. Absolutely. <laughs> I love that. Mm -hmm. Um, and I'll actually mention too, Amanda has joined us. She I've got her connected, so she's she's here. Amanda Sweet is our technology innovation librarian here at the Nebraska Library Commission. She has a lot of shows in, for us about technology, and her and Brian work a lot together. So cool. she's here to um, share her uh, voice as well. You need to unmute yourself though, Amanda. And go to webinar. <laughs> you know that would probably help. <laughs> there you go. So she is here to chime in as well. <laughs> Hey, Amanda. Um, one of the other things that I think are really important for us to look at and understand is the impact of music. And so for, for a long while now, there's the uh, educational benefit of what's called music therapy. It helps people remember stories. It helps people relax. It helps people do a lot of things. Um, and so just even having going back farther, like we had vinyl and sets to CDs to iPods to streaming services. And now we're in the age where no one saves music and you just connect to Spotify, Apple Music, and away you go. Um, but there's also a lot of really great therapeutic benefits to having vinyl. Uh, it just sounds a little different. And the act of putting the record player on a vinyl player um, helps trigger memories for people. Absolutely. And so yeah. what can we do in our library space? And I have the solution. And so this is called a simple music player, uh, and it works very similar to like an old record player, um, where you lift the, the, the player open and music plays. Uh, and you can preload any kind of music you want onto the player and to skip songs, you just push a little button. Um, hmm. So this is a really great tool. So if you're building like a senior room or a serenity room, um, this helps people have that kind of clarity or a place to relax, a place to de-stress. You can even leverage this in teens, teen rooms too for people with uh, auditorial challenges um, mm -hmm. where they get like overstimulated or something and they need something calming like the sound of water or, or whatnot. Um, you can leverage this tool called the Simple Music Player. And again, mm -hmm. the idea of using music as a therapeutic tool is not a new concept, um, but it's an often forgotten concept. And so I think us leveraging something as simple as this uh, can really add a lot of value in our library spaces. And how does the music get added to that? Is it like, do you just do, is it like a playlist or something or is it? Yeah, it, it, comes, it comes preloaded with music that's in the public domain now, oh, um, nice. but you can upload your own music via a flash drive on the back. Oh, nice. Okay. So what kind of programs can we do with this? Uh, 
we can use, so what's really fun, I'm a nerd, so I have to slip this in. Uh, we can use AI to create music. And so inviting our seniors into our library space and saying, hey, let's make a song about your grandkids. What are their names? Let's type them out. What do they like doing? Let's type it out and hit generate a song. And now they have this great song to remember their grandkids' names and the things that they like that they can lend reference at any point in time or what their birthdays are, whatever it may be. Um, you can also host concerts and festivals. So the library I used to work at in Mokina, Illinois, we did a lot of these where we would host um concerts and stuff like like from local artists in the neighborhood uh mm -hmm. and it was a really big success and it was very it was free for the most part um technology for photography and film has shifted over the years uh, remember when we had like the big like vhs things you carried around with a giant vhs player you slapped that in there and then suddenly it became smaller and then suddenly it became digital and suddenly that all stopped and you just carry your cell phone around instead. Um, what is all that doing for us? Um, and so I think there's an opportunity to go back and go, hey, let's teach some classes on how to take photos, um, how we can edit those photos with our either our, our, our new age devices or even leveraging old age devices. Um, and where to save these photos. So I've, I've taken a million photos, but I can't save them all on my phone. Like, what do I do or where do I save them? I think teaching anyone, not just seniors in this regard, that is very important and something that's sometimes overlooked. Um, and then obviously slipping in the new age stuff. How do we, can we show people how to use AI to create new images or edit images and enhance images? Um, and so I was messing with a friend uh, a few days ago and I was like, I was at a museum and I had like a broken cast link uh, or a broken arm x-ray. So I took a picture of it and I'm like, oops, I'm never traveling here again. And then everyone's like, oh my God, are you okay? And so I then like took a photo of me with a, and then I used AI to put a cast on my arm. I just typed in add cast. And I had a pretty realistic photo in a couple seconds that I was able to punk all my friends. I probably shouldn't joke like that, but um, they need it in their lives. They need to feel stress. Um, <laughs> Boo. <laughs> Use AI to help create images and enhance images is, is, is really big. Uh, the other concept I think is important to discuss and dive in is how does gaming involve, get, get evolve? Um, we had like the classic arcade games uh, where we had like the little joystick, one or two people played at a time. Uh, but now a lot of games are like massive online games where like 30, 40 people are all playing together and it's telling some story arc. Um, so how has that shifted uh, and what can we do to reflect back and give seniors, especially those with memory care, they don't want to play the Xbox, they probably want to play, you know, an arcade game instead. Get your Raspberry Pi, set up a arcade games. Yeah. yeah. Uh, those are fun. And they're really, and it's really inexpensive to do. Like you can, as Amanda says, you can get a Raspberry Pi, you can preload it, buy the, um, the board for it with the joystick and the buttons for like less than a hundred bucks. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. The most expensive thing is probably like an old monitor that you don't want anymore and you just put that and away you go. Yeah. Um, so I encourage people to like, you know, find the old classic arcade game consoles or building one as Amanda suggests. Um, but there's also a lot of like local enthusiasts that would love to bring their arcade games in. I have a good friend and he, before he got married, he had like 30 or 40 some odd like old console arcade games in his garage. Uh, nice. After he got married, he was he has less um, because the cars have to fit in the garage. Um, oh, yeah, fair. That's but it. his trick around it was letting people borrow his arcade games uh, and having them in like a library or a place of work uh, and letting people, because his passion was arcade mm -hmm. games. And so there's local enthusiasts that'd be more than happy because they're not allowed to have that many anymore and they would love to place it in your library. So just asking, uh, you'll see. Uh, board games and puzzles are also very, very huge, uh, especially for people with memory care challenges. And so having a collection of puzzles or board games would be very, very beneficial. Um, and it's also a great bonding experience for their loved ones and, the, and their caregivers to come together in, the, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a safe air environment uh, inside the library. Oopsies. So again, since I'm a nerd, I want to talk about nerdy things, so AR and VR. So how does this play a role with adults or people with memory care challenges? 
So VR allows for people to be transported to like entirely new locations. And if you have dementia or Alzheimer's, travel is usually not recommended. Um, and so how do we give people that opportunity to travel without having to take a plane or a boat or a train? Um, leveraging VR is one really easy uh, way to do so in the comfort of their own space. Uh, even with those with mobility challenges can benefit from doing activities like this. Uh, AR is augmented reality, and that allows for us to interact in our physical space on top of virtual space at the same time. Um, so we can use AR to do wayfinding or language translations uh, and a lot more. So how do we see this in the library world? Um, we can do virtual travel, like imagine doing a history tour or a museum tour in our library space. Everyone puts on a headset and a narrator just explains what's going on. Um, or doing city tours, <coughs> excuse me. Um, connecting with family members from anywhere in the world. Uh, you can pop on a VR headset and like have a video call and see their digital avatar. Uh, or what about, and this one's a really neat idea that I want someone to do. Um, there's a company called Hollow Ride, and the way Hollow Ride works, it's a device that fits into a car, um, and somebody drives this, drives the vehicle around, and it uses map data to know where all the buildings are at, and it overlays a VR environment around where all the buildings are. So let's say you want to go on a safari, uh, the mountain ranges would be your skyscrapers, if you will, and cars would turn into animals on your VR headset. Or this is where I think would be like, so that's like their vision. My vision is, let's say you, you put your VR headset on and as a passenger, not a driver, and the buildings that you see today are overlaid with the buildings of history, like yesterday's, like a hundred mm -hmm. years ago, that bank used to be uh, a farmer's hut or something. Uh, and showing that like as someone drives around as a tour would be super, super cool. Uh, mm -hmm. And they have the SDK kits for it. It's doable. Uh, and they say it's easy. I'm like, I'm, I don't know. But <laughs> I want a library to do that so I can participate in my idea. So. Do it. Uh, Nebraska, and on their website, I they look awesome. Yeah, it's very, very cool. And it's not like horribly expensive to buy either. Mm -hmm. uh, so VR and AR connects people together. Uh, we can set up connection rooms, like planning a Zoom session, but instead it's for VR for family members to connect to loved ones. Spatial would probably be good for that. Yeah, I think spatial would work right. Seniors and um, spatial, it even sounds cool. Yeah, that's <laughs> oh, um, oh, of course, the our Wi-Fi just blocked the spatial website, but I know it's safe to go to. What? Yeah. Yeah, Fortigard caught me oh going to spatial. They were like, you shall not pass. And I was like, you win, Fortigard. You win. <laughs> yeah. mm. uh, there's a lot of therapeutic benefits of VR and AR. Um, it helps build cognitive functions. Um, doing tours of a place they've been to before, or even videos, watching videos or whatnot on it. Um, helps bring old memories back, like that mental stimulation, like, oh, I've been to Rome before, I remember this building. Um, it's a great way to bring people together and do group tours because you can link headsets together and do a like a tour of an aquarium as a group uh, and doing outreach in nursing homes. And they're like, Brian, I don't believe you. Like, where did you get this information? There are tons of companies out there that do this. Like it's a paid service that nursing homes pay for and libraries do it for free. And we have a lot of the tech. Amanda has a lot of the tech. Yeah, um, the so there's actually, somebody called... Go ahead, Amanda. People have actually checked the kits out here and used them in retirement homes. So they sent me pictures okay. of these people that were like, um, she captioned it the first time he saw a dinosaur and he's in a <laughs> chair just going like, <laughs> you know, it was That's awesome. How I would react. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, this company called Rendever has been doing it for a few years now, uh, and they bring uh, tours to nursing homes. So they'll be like, we're going to tour Italy today. Everyone puts your headset on, and uh, the guide will point things out as we walk around Italy um, and look at things and look at buildings, and the guide can see what everyone else is staring at. So if they see everyone staring at, like, you know, the Sistine Chapel or something, they can talk to it. Um, so that's Rendever. There's also companies that are putting together 
uh, AR apps for memory recall. And this one's called O Orion, O O R I O N. Uh, and the way it works, it has, it has like a library of like 80,000 objects already loaded or something to that effect. And it will help you find objects in your space. So you like scan your room and help you find it. But what it's also supposed to do is help find lost items. So over time, it learns like your coffee table doesn't have anything on it and you throw your keys there, I suppose. And so someday if you're like, I don't know where my keys are at and you scan your room and it sees a newspaper on the coffee table, the tech is supposed to say, hey, it might be under that newspaper. Under the newspaper, wow. My keys are always um, don't know, so like, weird. Mm -hmm. That's why I have air tags on mine, because oh, I, I should do, that. do not remember where I put anything. And so like, I air tag almost all my stuff that I lose constantly, which is everything. I should do that. I'm tiling everything. Uh, it also can operate entirely offline. Uh, and it uses the iPhone screen reader to help you detect like objects and stuff too. So tech for all. So again, I'm like I, I fall victim to this as well. This this thinking of everyone can use all tech at all times of their life cycle, uh, and that's not entirely true. And so understanding learning differences, as I'm calling them, I think are very very important. And so how do we? The questions that I always want to ask ourselves when we're looking at programs now is what types of learning difficulties exist? Whether that's Alzheimer's, dementia, dyslexia, ADHD. And how can we incorporate technology that can help augment that? There's a group called Culture City, or they spell culture with a K, that helps you make your library space a all-inclusive space for people with like um, these types of things, uh, like any cognitive or diverse needs. Um, they have like activities and stuff you can do. And then if you go through their classes and get like the right setups for them like like headphones for people that get uh overstimulated and things like that you get a sticker for your window and so when people go to your library they i can most of these people know what that means and they're like oh cool my kid can feel safe here because or my adult parent can feel safe here because you went through the training to know what these things are and how they're going to react was it culture city yeah and culture spelled with a k Oh, they're a nonprofit. Cool. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's a great group. Um, hmm. So this is one like simplified high tech tool, and this is called uh, Rosie. And so Rosie is a alarm clock with like the idea of Google or Alexa Home built into it. Uh, and the idea is that you're supposed to be able to talk. It's entirely offline. It helps you remember things uh, that you that you know, a loved one would preload to it. Uh, their caregiver would preload to it. At the same time, you can build your own with like Google, with a Google kit, uh, and you can load it with library related questions, answers, things about the town, local phone numbers people might need to know, and then let people check that out. Another thing that I've never considered until I started learning more about dementia and Alzheimer's, um, or people with cognitive challenges, is how they see alarm clocks or how they see clocks in general. And so the reason why a lot of schools still have old clocks like this and nursing homes typically don't have LCD clocks is because the dots in the clock don't look like numbers once you reach that like decline in cognitive function. They look just like dots and you can't see it. it's a 12. It just looks mm -hmm. like some dots in a weird shape. Um, and so putting these types of clocks in and are helpful for people that see only dots and so it's a very like simple fix like oh we can put like these clocks in instead of like the nice fancy lcd clocks because these people can read sweet i did not know that no me neither hmm. i learned a lot uh what about pets so there's a lot of therapeutic benefits to having pets in your library space as well um, and so what we could do is use dowels or animated pets like a teddy bear. Uh, it's proven to reduce stress, agitation, depression. That's why kids like stuffed animals. The same reason why adults like real animals, um, because they bring us some sort of comfort and joy. Um, but there's an idea of using pet therapy to introduce responsibility, a structure, 
uh, and like how to care for something in a in those environments. You can't give them a live animal. Uh, if you have dementia or Alzheimer's, it's not a wise bet, but you can use a robotic pet to do so. So introducing like realistic dolls or pets is one way to get there. Um, so here are some examples. So the kitty cat on the right is called Meta, and you can actually talk to it. And you can say, hey, Meta, meow, or something. And it, it'll like reply to you with meows and purr. If you pet it, it'll purr at you. You can ask it to give it your paw. It gives it your paw. You have a, it comes with a brush. You can brush it and it has your brush and it purrs and looks at you. Um, and so it gives you like this overly creepy, but it, people seem to like it. I would be terrified of it, um, <laughs> but it works. And then the dog, it's, um, it's for stress relief. It breathes like it's sleeping and it mimics the uh, a breathing rate that should match your heart rate. So over time, as it sits in your lap, your heart rate will match like if you're anxious or stressed, um, your heart rate will naturally match the breathing rhythm of the dog and it will, it will calm you down. Wow. And I totally uh, pet that cat too at the conference. She was awesome. Yeah. <laughs> and they're not like the meta cat's a little expensive, but those are the dogs and the, and the dolls are not like they're relatively inexpensive and really simple turnkey solutions. Like, oh, hey, here's a dog. If you're want to sit and read a newspaper, put it on your lap, read the newspaper, feel relaxed, mm -hmm. and you provide this, this amazing experience um, for people that come into your library. There's also tools to help with memory recall, like such as locking locks, opening doors, ringing doorbells. Um, and so these are called busy activity boards. Um, and so some examples are like, it's the idea of using therapy to make everyday items make sense again. Um, so if you're suffering from memory loss, you can play with this and fidget with it long enough. You go, okay, I remember what this is now. Uh, and it's like a memory booster, like you would train your brain for flashcards, if you will. It looks like the last escape room I was in. Oh, nice. <laughs> Uh, this is another like really easy product to incorporate into a library space. If you're building spaces for people with memory care or dementia or even ADHD. Um, so this thing is called the Fiddle Mitt. It's designed for, again, people with like Alzheimer's dementia. But the idea is it's so when people are nervous, they fidget or they pick their fingers, which isn't isn't fun. Like That, that hurts. Uh, and so what this does, it gives us something else to play with. And it's, you put your hands inside of it. So no one knows you're fiddling with like, there's like a ball and other things inside. Mm. Um, so now you can like have this in your lap, you can fidget and not be embarrassed. Um, and so this is great for all ages, not just seniors, I believe, because it promotes that sensory idea, it reduces anxiety because you can fiddle and play. Like I have, I mean, I'm playing with one now. I have a little fidget stuff on my desk that I constantly mm -hmm. play with. Um, it's like I and run my, oh, what's that? It's like I run my thumb along the inside of my fingers all the time. And I've done oh. it for since forever. So I do the sleeve trick and I just cover it up and then no one sees it while I'm in public. If it looks like a small animal that's been punched in the face. A little bit. A little bit. You, you have to admit it. <laughs> it is very interesting looking. Yeah. Oh. And they're, like you throw them in a, in, a, in a washing machine to clean. They're super easy. My sister-in-law so has... Oh, no, go for it. No, go ahead. My sister-in-law has one of those like mink muff things. Mm -hmm. And yeah. she's like a closet fiddler, which like a closet fidgeter inside of her muff. <laughs> oh <wow>. yeah <laughs> so the question is how do you set up these programs where we get these things how do we leverage them in our library space um you know very simply let people borrow them borrow them and let them loan them out for like a month instead of two weeks because again it, it, it's a memory card tool they'll probably want it a little bit longer than two weeks um provide instructions so like have little cards that a caregiver can like read and understand uh and understanding the difference between a caregiver and a user is very important because directions would differ for both. Like a caregiver may have to add extra, extra explanations of why they have this, what it's for, uh, whereas the user may just need to know what to do with it. Um, 
if we're doing it as library events, like having people set up like a room or having it on display for people to pick up and use is probably the easiest execution of it. Um, or if you're running a library program, uh, having people sit in a circle and pass these items around and talk about it is another really great thing to do. I want to get the reviews on the MIT and just see what people think about it. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and so my goal today is to introduce not only like uh, procedures or products, but like what else can we do to improve our engagement in our libraries for seniors? Um, so like one really simple thing is like learning new languages. Um, older people love learning more than I think teens, well, that's the obvious one, more than I think adults, uh, like early age adults when they go into school and they're having a good time learning. I think once you reach a certain point, like learning new things is, is awesome. Uh, and so teaching language classes is a very inexpensive, fun thing to do within your library space. Um, or even thinking through how do we make accessibility easier uh, with our apps, text-to-speech, uh, what types of fonts are we using, larger text, voice control, um, anything that we implement into our library space, we should consider like how easy is it to use at our library and can we teach patrons how to set these things up for personal use, which we've been doing for years without, without issue. Um, and so I would say we continue doing that. Some other fun library engagement activities. This one's a game called The Call to Mind. Uh, the purpose of it is to promote like meaningful conversations uh, and helps people, library visitors, caregivers, the loved ones that have these things in a, in a fun little environment to play games with. And this is one way to do that. Um, it's great for like different age, group, age groups. Uh, it helps promote inclusivity. And it's like this, and it's very easy. There's like a card game. Um, you spin a dial, you pick up the card type, and whatever first comes to mind, you talk about. It's like, like a icebreaker thing. Or this is another more of a, a tactile game where you throw a ball around and you catch the ball or you roll it. Um, depending on the age group you're using, rolling might be better. Uh, and then when you stop it from rolling, if you're sitting at a table, wherever your thumb lands is the question you answer. So like seasons I enjoy, food I can cook, my childhood best friend. Uh, and the idea is it's not only promoting like this conversation component and ice breaking, uh, it helps promote dexterity and eye coordination, the like physical activity that also leverages uh, like trying to do memory recall and having discussions with people. Um, so yeah, that's, it's called the thumb ball. Uh, and another one, another like memory activity is this one's called Shake Loose a Memory. Uh, it's, a, it's a dice with cards in it. You roll it, you pull out the card, you answer the question. Um, and again, very similar to the other, other games, it's dexterity, you get people talking. It's again, really great for families to use as a group. So the, the caregiver, their loved ones, and then the person that ha that's affected with it uh, come together and play and checking it out, doing it at home or running it as a library program with a group of people is even better. <laughs> Uh, and then a little bit about like, how do we empower independence? Um, so we can put classes together about uh, how to use smart home technology, how to like basically build your own life alert systems for the caregivers. And so you can give them environments that are safe uh, and then they're still voice activated mobile apps. You can check in on them. Um, you know, how do we gain independence by using these smart tech? Uh, and the emotional impact is like, you know, we're giving people autonomy and control over their environments. And so we're having like smart bots are getting better and better. And like, they even have healthcare ones that like follow people around and remind them to take their meds, um, say good morning and ask them about their day, whether or not the bot cares, I don't think, I don't, I don't know if it does, um, <laughs> but it's, it's designed like to have to like conversations. That's too busy trying to figure out how to take over the world, I think. But <laughs> I mean, it can multitask. Little sure. column A, little column B. Mm -hmm. So what else can we do? I think one of the things that we are missing out on is running classes on how to support people with dementia or Alzheimer's or other memory challenges. Um, there isn't a lot of resources out there that are free. 
um, like sure the all time association is a resource, but looking at the web page, it's complicated. Even for someone like me, like I can digest large amounts of information pretty quick. That's a challenge for me looking at that website. And that's without me having any emotional baggage or any, any emotional constraints of like, oh, I got to solve this because I just found out my dad has Alzheimer's. I don't have that. Like, but imagine oh, yeah, being in those shoes. you out already and, and then yeah. you're trying to figure out what to, what can I do now? Yeah. Like when my, most, oh, go ahead, Amanda. Like when my grandpa was diagnosed with Alzheimer's, we were trying to look for all these different resources and we were running around and there's so much at the time there wasn't as much stuff as there is now but just trying to navigate it all is a nightmare correct mm -hmm. i had other four letter words in mind but i didn't say them so there you go <laughs> you know? uh, so i think i think there's a, a huge importance to running classes for the caregivers um, like and having it like once a month even and maybe no one shows uh, and maybe one person shows one month. And I think having it on a reoccurring schedule is going to be important, especially since it's an increasing uh, disease. Like more and more people are getting it. It's not mm -hmm. something that's improving over time. Um, and so I think having these classes and making sure that people know that there's help available at the library, whether we're, you're doing product support or not, um, but just teaching people where, where you can go to get help. The cost of a nursing home for those with memory challenges is like 300 bucks a night. Like that's it's more lot. expensive than a fancy hotel. And that's ridiculous to me. Uh, and so most folks are then like, well, I can't afford that. So I guess mom or dad or whoever is moving in with me or I don't have the space. So they got to stay home and I got to spend more time checking in on them, but I have no clue what to do. So I think running these workshops and running these classes and showing where the resources are. There's lots of actual, there's some grant money, not a lot that's available for people with Alzheimer's dementia. Um, I was talking to someone and they said there is still more funding for aid support than there is for Alzheimer's and dementia, which impact more people than people with AIDS or something to that effect. Hmm. Other countries, however, are investing more and more money in Alzheimer's dementia United States has not changed the amount of money they're investing in this type of stuff. Wow. Maybe they forget about it. I don't know. Um, that would be kind so, of ironic, though. Uh, yeah. <laughs> so I think it's. I think there's a there's a golden opportunity that a library can fit into and provide these like the supportive community uh, that I think we're missing out on. And I think if we do this, we can help like really raise awareness and maybe even start helping find funding available for people that can't afford their nursing home and figuring out other ways to support them. And experimenting with offering the classes virtually or in person is also good because some of mm -hmm. the caregivers want to get out of the house, but other ones they can't get out of the house because they're like the person might wander out of the house and get into trouble. They need so, to be yeah. Yeah. So a lot of resources we have, like I'm sure our library is chocked full of resources on dementia and Alzheimer's. Um, but the thing is that I've seen, it's a very sensitive topic, um, especially for those that have it. So I was looking into that why, and it turns out like way back when it was actually considered like bad juju if you were sick. So if you had like a, like a debil debilitating illness, people wouldn't say anything like cancer, for example, because mm. it wasn't widely discussed at that point in time. And so people will just not want to mention that they have cancer and eventually succumb to it um, because it was considered like you don't want to be shunned from your family as a result. Uh, and I think since that period of time was when they were children, now that they're getting older, I think that that stigma is, well, if I have all times dementia, I can't say anything because I'll be treated differently. Um, and so since it is a sensitive topic, one suggestion I saw was putting like private bags of books when requested. So like, hey, we can put the books that you want in a, in a paper bag. So when you come to the library, no one knows what you're carrying out uh, or even doing the, the, the paper bag wraps like we did when we were in school when you wanted to protect your textbooks. Just um, don't use a black was, bag and you'll be fine. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> so I've seen a few people doing things like that to help it make feel a little less safe or feel, feel a little bit more safe yeah. um, but there's a lot of great resources out there um, i gave a link to a, some dvd sets as well that talk through 
how to support people. Um, and again, like we have tons of books. Let's like like put a section together and say, hey, here's our here's our book collection about it, and here's the here's the monthly class we teach people on. Each month is a slightly different topic, whatever it may be. And there's free resources out there to get trained and certified on like educating people about Alzheimer's dementia as well. So I fed my PowerPoint, this PowerPoint to AI, and I asked, what should we call a room for seniors? Like I, I taught it what the makerspace was. And I was like, I need a room for seniors though that are safe. Uh, and what it did was it spat out what it called the serenity room. Uh, and it said no furniture on wheels because it's a slip hazard. Um, big screens, large displays, uh, and a lot of like natural lights. And so I was like, well, that's kind of cool. So I used AI to come up with the term serenity room uh, as the solution for a space for people with memory care challenges or ADHD or whatever it may be. Hmm. Oh, and I also right. mentioned uh, armrest so they can get uh, push themselves out of the chair. That's actually just what I was about to say because my, yeah. <laughs> Yeah. You got there before me. Mm -hmm. I tried. So that's all I have for you all. Um, I hope, so for those that are watching the recording, for those that are listening live, one of the objectives that I want to hopefully come out of these conversations that I'm doing with, with libraries all over the country is finding folks that want to work on this, this project uh, and then finding the funding to execute it. Um, and so I really think that there's a there's a really great opportunity for us to like solve a really big world problem. Um, and that's kind of why I've always done what I've done is I like to look for a world problem and how do you solve it and execute a solution. And so if you're interested in solving towards this and putting programs and things like that together, feel free to email me. If you don't have the funding available, we'll find the funding together. Like I have people looking for grants and stuff like that to help um, build serenity rooms and stuff like that. I think this would be really kind of uh, great to do. And so with that, I'll stop sharing and leave it open for Q&A. And yeah. Krista, would this qualify for any of the NLC grants? Um, yes, definitely. Um, Probably the library development library grants. Yeah. Library improvement grants, yes. Um, here, yeah, I'll bring up my screen here anyway. Um, so yeah, thank you so much, uh, Brian, for sharing all of that. That's so many good resources. Um, so if anyone has any questions or comments, um, type into the questions section of your GoToWebinar interface. Um, we have plenty of time. We can talk about anything you're interested in, anything you want to know more about. Um, is anybody doing anything like this in their libraries already? Has anybody done anything related to this? Um, and is anyone interested in working with, with Brian? So um, obviously reach out to him, but you can type in the questions section now. Um, if you want to, I'll keep an eye on that for you. Um, but yeah, when you're talking about funding, and actually I will go to our, we have a session coming up at the end of the month about the library Nebraska Library Commission grants for 2025. <laughs> so that kind of feeds right into that um, very nicely. Yes, um, we have grants here through the Library Commission. They're gonna open on September 20th. Um, CE and training grants at CE and training for um, your staff, not for you training um, your patrons. Um, internships grants where you can hire additional staff, um, library improvement grants for programs and services and equipment, furniture, and then youth grants for excellence, specifically for children's and teens um, programming. Um, but yes, our library improvement grants uh, would definitely be uh, the appropriate one to uh, apply for for anything related to the, anything like this any of these um, if you want to get any of this kind of equipment or get any of these um, services or um, resources or build one of these rooms um, we don't have a ton of money but we do have funding where we can help you with some of it um, so definitely these library improvement grants these are federal funds that we get from the museum institute of museum and library services um, and you'll be applying for 2025. Um, the end of the month, we're having a session about it. So if you want to learn more about the grants, you can sign up for that in Compass Live. Um, the, um, all of our grants will open up on September um, 20th and be due um, November 15th. 
So you have quite a couple of months to come up with a program proposal um, if you want to, and then the funds would be issued um, in 2025. Um, and these are all based on LSTA, Library Services and Technology Act purposes. So, um, and even if you weren't building like a full on room, you could probably do some of like the lending kits or get some of the resources or establish like the caregiver services and good times were had by all. And that is a very alarming shade of red. What, up here? Yeah. <laughs> That's so people know they're not open Look yet. They're not... <laughs> These are red boxes, yeah. Um, these are for Nebraska public libraries and um, state institutional libraries as well are eligible for these grants. So um, things like our, um, and we do have listed here, um, Norfolk Veterans Home, um, Western Nebraska Veterans Home. So any of those um, type of facilities would be eligible. You can also partner with any of these groups or um, any of the um, public libraries. So if there's some other group that's not eligible that you wanna work with, um, they could be you know, a joint um, yeah. grant application. I know there's a lot of libraries that are actually built right next to retirement homes too. Mm -hmm. And so that's almost like a built-in partnership, which is handy. Yeah, can, yeah. if you're already near a retirement home or a senior center or something, definitely reach out to them. Yeah. And then like you as the library could apply for this grant from us and then bring that service, you know, to the seniors in the senior center of the retirement home. Yep. Um, just have to have one of these eligible entities, public library, or one of those other institutions that we list that are um, one of the applicants on this applicant, this grant from us. It might be worth actually reaching out to the libraries that we know are built right next to a retirement home and just let them know about this, because they probably don't know how this exists. I have no idea who how if I would know that, but <laughs> you know, I was pondering how to. We don't actually keep data on which libraries are right next to a retirement home, but Alana would probably know some of them. Possibly, yeah. Yeah. Um, but so we've got this webinar coming up when the when the grants are available, um on the twentieth. We'll put out a, our usual pushing out of onto our mailing lists and our social media about that the grants are open, um, and reminding libraries that uh, they can apply. And Brian, I think you showed me before a website that had a bunch of these like guides and resources on it. Could oh, you yeah. share that? Oh. You might have shared it already, but if you could reshare it. Um, do you want me to make you presenter again so you can show? What... Uh, no, I'll just paste the link in the chat. Okay. Um, and I did grab some of the links here that the whole ride there and the Culture City um, links just so y'all can see what they are look like here cool um right here yes and this one you've seen is also mentioned so um the slides here that you've been using um is this something that you're going to provide later for uh for people to have access to as well to put it up with a recording yep. right yep. so you have access the slide. to the slides um but here is i saw this yeah this is linked a lot when um on the slides of well mindcarestore.com so this and is what working with. I know that I sifted through some of these resources before. So if you could scroll down a little bit. So the program, the memory care program booklets and the bundles for libraries are probably some that you'd want to check out first. And then I mean, read all of it, but those were, if you're short on time, those are good. And the infographics are awesome. Ah, uh, here's so, some kids that you could, yeah, so here's some actual things you can get from. Yeah. So if you're doing like that. grant planning or budgeting, then these are kind mm -hmm. of like pre-baked for you, so you don't have to think about it too hard, because the people that design it and have done this have already put it together. Sort of like how I put together the tech kit, so you don't have to think about it too hard. Yep, and this would definitely be eligible for our grant, definitely. Yep. Nice. And you can pet a robot cat. <laughs> That's just winning all around. If you want to, sure. 
<laughs> um, I do also have a page of grant opportunities for Nebraska libraries um, that I try and promote uh, just general grants on all sorts of that are out there available um, beyond just our grants. So these are some other resources you could possibly um, some of them are specifically for books or for furniture or capital improvements, but some are just to support libraries. So um, I definitely recommend taking a look. And I'm always updating this page with new ones and, and that are coming out. So um, I have to update. Oh, the Keywit Foundation. I was just at the Luminarium and I met the guys who run that. Oh, they're okay. awesome. Um, and see, this talks about programs and um, capital projects. Um, and then just some other resources for getting grant funding. Grant Station, I highly recommend. Um, they do sell a product to help you, you know, to, if you want to find grants, but they have a weekly newsletter also that I follow. So you can get um, things that are up that um, I just get links to here's grants that are available um, for free. And ALA fixed their grant page so you can actually navigate it better. It used yes, to be. They did update yeah. this. It used yeah. to be this long, painful list, but I meant, yeah, it is. Um, much prettier has oh except for i have the wrong link well that's not good we'll fix that but yes okay. there is um an ala public programming office or programming um is what also provides a lot of um, information about grants so many grants <laughs> so there's lots of resources you just got to get there and look um think outside the box you know look for things that don't necessarily mention libraries that must might mention seniors or senior servicing or yeah. whatever um or just municipality something for your city or your municipality that is eligible for and your library being a department of the city becomes eligible for those grant opportunities as well and there's a lot of stuff that you can do that you don't even need funding for at all so that's a win too. Yeah. Awesome. Well, thanks again for having me, everybody. Yeah, someone did want to know your contact information again. Can you just, uh, your email address at Evolve, right? Uh, yep, bpitchman at evolveproject.org. I'll show up on the slide really quick. Yeah, it's on that slide there. Yeah. All right. And I'll uh, grab it out of my email. So I'll I just can paste it in the chat. Stuff. Oh, cool. Awesome. Well, thanks again for having me. That's the page I was looking for, ALA grants. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's all shiny with a better layout and everything. Yeah. So um, there is a lot of information, but here's the upcoming one, the ones that are coming most um, deadlines coming up. Yeah, I'm glad that they actually plucked out the ones that have the upcoming deadline because you used mm -hmm. to have to click on each one of them to find then, out when yeah, it was. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, I have to chat though. Yeah. Nice yeah, thank with you. You all. yeah, thanks a lot, Brian. Uh send me those slides when you get a chance and then yeah. uh, we will have the recording available for everyone. All right. Awesome. Um all right, yeah. So thank you everybody. So yeah. Bye bye, Brian. Thank and you. I'll see you later. Yeah. So uh, thank you everyone for attending today. Um, the show is recorded, is being recorded, of course, as usual. Um, these are all our, if you use your search engine of choice and type in Encompass Live, you will come up with our main page and our archive page. These are our upcoming shows. I said I would show you this here at the bottom is a link to our archive shows. The most recent one is at the top of the list so today's show will be there um should be there by the end of the day tomorrow um everyone who attended today and registered for today's show will get an email sent um or from me when it's ready so you know when the recording's up and there will be a link let's see if you last one they'll like this one from last week there'll be a link to the recording on the library commission's youtube channel and to um the slides that we will have from uh brian um, we also push out into our various social media. We have a Facebook page for Encompass Live. If you like to use Facebook, give us a like over there. We post reminders about the show. Here's a reminder to log into today's show, meet the presenter, and then here we go from last week when we did announce when the recording is available. Um, we also push out onto our Twitter and Instagram using the hashtag EncompLive onto the Library Commission's Twitter and Instagram. Um, 
So you can also look for that hashtag out there to see um, if uh, when things are available. Um, while we're looking at the archives here, I will show you there is a search feature. So you can see if we've done a topic of anything that you may be interested in. Um, and I'm not gonna scroll through this whole list because it is pretty long as you can see, if you can see the little scroll bar over here. Um, yeah. This is our full show archives going back to when Encompass Live first premiered, which was in January, 2009. So we're, I think we're 16 years in now. Epic. Crazy, yeah. <laughs> but um, we have all of our show archives here. So just um, pay attention. When, if you're gonna watch any of our old shows, pay attention to the original broadcast date. Everything has a date on it. Some of the shows will be fine to watch. They'll have be, still be good, useful resources, stand the test of time, but some things will become old and outdated. Um, resources or program or services may have changed drastically, might not exist anymore. Um, people might not work at the same place they worked at when they presented for us. Uh, links might be broken. Um, so just pay attention to that date, be aware of what you're watching, how old it is. Um, but um, as libraries do, we'll keep things for historical purposes. And um, we will always have, as long as we have a place to keep them, um, we will always have all of our show archives available to you. And right now they're all on our YouTube channel. All right, so that wraps up for today's show. I do wanna make, since Amanda's here, a little notice so people are aware, we did make a little change to our Pretty Sweet Tech for this month. Um, normally, Amanda comes on the last Wednesday of every month to talk about something techie. And you can see here, she's in for October 30th, but at the end of this month, she's not available. So we've done a little swap. Um, she is gonna be yeah. on October, she's gonna have something for us, but um, she's gonna be on twice in October. Um, but we do have five Wednesdays in October, so that's okay. Um, so October yeah. 2nd is when Amanda will be here. So not the last Wednesday of September, but October 2nd, she'll be back to talk about digital navigators and digital equity in Nebraska. Yeah. And that's also been a huge topic in grants and everything. Yeah. So, mm -hmm. yeah. Definitely a, a buzzword that, and an important thing, this digital equity yeah. is very important what's happening everywhere, but there is specific things happening here in Nebraska that you all should be aware of. So definitely do uh, sign up for that one. So yep. she will be on October 2nd. Um, and the last Wednesday this month will be our grant presentation in two weeks that I already mentioned. Um, and you see, we've got our schedule booked out here going into November already. Um, also be aware, October 9th, we do not have a show. We will not be having an Encompass Live. It is the week of our state, um, Nebraska Library Association annual conference. We always take that week off. So be aware that there is no Encompass Live that week because most many of us will be um, in Kearney um, and busy with conference that week. All right, so that's it for today. I hope uh, next week we are going to be talking about problem solving in your library using the Toward Gigabit Libraries Toolkit. Um, this is a resource that we've had on the show a few times before. Um, it's a great um, thing for anyone who is trying to understand if they need to update and what's going on with their broadband, with their um, IT. Um, we have a network closet full of um, racks and wires and pieces of equipment you don't know what it is. This can help you figure all that out. <laughs> And Stephanie Sinberg and Carson Block will be joining us again um, to talk about new things going on with the Toward Gigabit Libraries Toolkit. Sorry. So please do uh, sign up for that one, register for that, and any of our other upcoming shows over the next few months. All right, Sorry. I think that's it. Thank you, everyone, for being here. Good to see you, Amanda. <laughs> and we'll see you back on October 2nd. It's true. Yeah. yeah. Hope we'll see some of you um, on other episodes of Encompass Live. Sweet. All right. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.